All right. Good morning, SAS. How's everyone feeling today? All right, good. Sounds like you all got at least one cup of coffee. Um, I'm Cooper Quinton. I'm a security researcher at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I research specifically uh, digital attacks against vulnerable populations, such as nation state attacks. And this is my colleague. Yeah, I'm uh, Michael Flossman. Um, I head out Lookout's uh, threat intelligence, uh, so focusing on mobile mostly. Um, and my colleague, Andrew Blaish, head of um, device intelligence, will be taking, representing Lookout for part two of this talk. So it's a two part back to back yeah. uh, investigation. And my colleague, Eva Galperin, as well from the EFF, is here and will be up here later. That's the second part of this. So we're here to talk to you today about Dart Caracal, which is a threat actor that we've been following since last summer, at least. And uh, we think it's pretty interesting. We're going to tell you why. We're going to start today with part one. We're going to talk about the background of Dart Caracal and how we came to find this threat actor. And we're going to talk about the mobile components and the desktop components that are used by Dart Caracal. And then in part two, uh, our colleagues will talk about data exfiltration, infrastructure and identities, and who Dart Caracal is, and a mysterious thing called Building 3F6. So first, some background. By a round of applause, how many of you have heard of Operation Mantle? OK, good. I mean, we did a Black Hat talk, so I'm glad a couple of you heard of it. So Operation Mantle, uh, in 2016, my colleague Eva Galbrin and I uh, started looking into some <clears throat> phishing emails that were sent to one of EFF's clients. This client, Irina Petrushova, runs a newspaper, which is Kazakhstan's only independent journalist outfit. And she had attracted much attention from the Kazakh government, including uh, the firebombing of her building and death threats. So she left the country, but then the government of Kazakhstan sued her uh, because they believed that she was part of a campaign of leaks that had leaked a lot of Kazakhstan's secrets. In the process of suing her, while she was in the middle of being sued, she started getting these strange phishing emails, and we started looking into them. And what we found was a large phishing and malware campaign which was spying on dissidents, journalists, and human rights lawyers and opposition politicians who were critical of the government of Kazakhstan. So, of course, given the targets, we think that the government of we thought that the government of Kazakhstan was likely behind this, but we didn't think that they did it themselves. We thought that these guys, Appen, were probably the culprits behind this. And this was based on some intelligence that we got and some overlap in the uh, TTPs between Appen and our actors, and some overlap in the domains and services used by Appen and our actors. Well, now it turns out that it was not Appen at all. Uh, and in fact, the answer to the question of who is behind this is a lot more exciting and a lot more interesting than we originally thought. So in our research, we came across several files which had been exfiltrated from infected uh, laptops and desktops. And we also came across some logs that indicated that there was a mobile presence to this malware as well. At the time, uh, we were getting ready for our Black Hat talk, and we ran out of time to really look for the mobile malware. We didn't find any samples, so we stopped looking at it. And this is where Lookout comes in. Yeah. Uh, so when the EFF released their report, what was really interesting naturally to us as a mobile security company was the fact that uh, not only was this a targeted attack, but there was a mobile component, still hadn't been found, um, and it was potentially still being used. Um, so what we did at Lookout was we, uh, we took a lot of the IOCs that were included in the EFF's original report, ran them across our data set, and as you can probably guess, based on the fact that we're up here presenting this, um, we found some, some interesting mobile leads that were connected to the same infrastructure that the EFF reported on. Um, so these trojanized applications, um, you know, they're, they're trojanized versions of uh, a range of different applications. Um, so secure messaging applications were among them. Um, so apps like Threema, Signal, WhatsApp, Primo, Plus Messenger. 
as well as um, applications that would be used by people interested in maintaining their privacy online. So we saw um, like the Tor application Orbot, Trojanized, as well as the VPN application Siphon. For some reason, um, people are still being socially engineered into installing Flash Player. I don't know how this still works, but um, we see it a lot. So I'm guessing actors are getting a lot of mileage with that one. Um, and then we also saw some Google Play uh, push Trojanized apps as well. So what was interesting with this actor, and um, something that we don't often see um, with other targeted threats, is that all these, or the majority of these applications were fully functional. And what I mean by that is um, the legitimate functionality of the Trojanized app was still intact, so that a, um, a victim um, who had this on their device would, would be less inclined to think something was amiss with that application. It's, it's, you know, they could still send messages, receive messages, um, but there was a little bit of something extra going on in the background. Um, and before I go on, just to, I suppose, give a bit of context as to why we've called this palace. Um, so you, you probably noticed a few slides earlier, um, a nice furry cat. Um, that's a mantle. So that's the mantle in op mantle. And another name for that cat is palace's cat. So palace, just in case you're wondering. So if you're unfortunate enough to have Palace on your mobile device, what can it do? What's the damage? Um, it's got a lot of stock functionality that you would expect to find in any sort of uh, targeted surveillance where tool um, taking advantage or aimed at, at mobile devices. So you know, we're talking recording audio, uh, both when you make calls, uh, as well as remotely an attacker remotely activating the microphone to, to record audio and surrounding environment um, sounds as well as intercepting text messages, exfiltrating all this information to command and control infrastructure, tracking the location of a device, um, as well as uh, scanning Wi-Fi SSID points and uh, sending that to, a, to an attacker um, server. And that'll come in handy later on down the track. Uh, as boring as it sounds, Wi-Fi access points, how valuable is this information? Uh, we'll see just how valuable that is um, when it comes to attribution. And then pretty much on the, on the right, we can see if you've got this on your device, you're going to have a bad day. Uh, an attacker can pretty much do anything, including downloading and installing additional applications, uh, as well as deleting content, um, and also retrieving messages and uh, decryption keys from messaging applications um, in the case that you're using a Trojanized uh, messaging app. <coughs> So how is Palace actually getting onto devices? During this investigation, we noticed um, several different attack vectors being used by this actor. Um, the, the primary one that we identified was uh, phishing messages delivered directly to victims via WhatsApp. Uh, and that would essentially direct them to a watering hole server, secureandroid.info, that was a fake app store and pretty much contained uh, a list of all these applications um, that were Trojanized versions. Uh, we also identified several Facebook groups that were serving up um, you know, similar phish phishing messages uh, directed at both a different server that was set up to harvest credentials for Twitter, Facebook, um, and Google. And then a lot of these phishing, phishing messages also directed to the watering hole server secureandroid.info. Um, one of the interesting things in this investigation was that from looking at the exfiltrated data, and we'll get into that a little bit later on in the second part of this talk, there was a good indication that physical access played a part, which was really interesting to see. Um, and then the main C2 server for, for Palace is um, Adobe Air.net. So, yeah, that's actually incorrect. <laughs> um, so here we can see some of those... Um, some of those uh, phishing messages are an example of that that we found in exfiltrated content, pretty much just saying, hey, how are you? We can communicate more if you just download and install this, uh, this secure version of Telegram. And then on the right, uh, this was one of the first messages that we identified being taken from a victim's device. And it kind of suggests that their device was out of their control at some point. So it reads, hey, I got my phone back. Please use this number for text and phone. Thanks. So that's a message from a victim 
uh, to a contact of theirs, and it was one of the first messages taken. Um, and that's uh, one of the strongest um, reasons why we believe physical access was used uh, by this actor. So taking a quick look at the, uh, the watering hole, it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. It's just, hey, here are a bunch of apps. Download them, nothing too fancy. It's not made to look like Google Play at all. Um, but we see this a fair amount fr um, from a number of different actors. So setting up watering holes with um, apps that require victims to have uh, you know, installations allowed from third-party sources. And if you uh, zoom in on the bottom, you'll see that quality is better than the original in these apps. I mean, that, that's really depending on your definition of better. I think the attacker certainly thinks it's better. Um, but lo looking, at this, um, looking at this malware family, um, you probably notice that there are no exploits or anything like that. Um, and you're absolutely right. In our investigation, we haven't found any use of you know, zero-day exploits or anything like that. This actor clearly favors social engineering, and they've been able to be pretty successful in just um, getting people to install applications. Uh, and when we have a look at the XFIL, you'll, you'll see just, um, just how large, just how much amount of data they've been able to pull from compromised devices. Uh, like, like a lot of um, uh, everyday developers uh, that have honest jobs, uh, these guys pulled a lot of code from Stack Overflow. So looking at their code base, we can see the way they've obfuscated their C2 um, information in their samples. Um, they're pretty much pulled straight from Stack Overflow. They've pulled other code from GitHub in the way that they, um, the way that they uh, exfiltrate and receive data, both on the client and the server. And they've really only made minor modifications to publicly available code. So it really goes to show that the level of investment uh, required by you know, threat actors to compromise mobile devices is more often than not a lot lower than uh, we actually expect. So I think the research community kind of tends to focus on those high-profile zero-day threats uh, like Pegasus, where you've got you know, um, yeah, Trident and uh, you know, three vulnerabilities being exploited and chained together, but more often than not, that isn't, uh, that isn't a requirement to get into this game. <laughs> what tends to work and what, te what we tend to see in a lot of investigations is that more often than not, a, a, a simple text message that's well-crafted <laughs> is pretty much all you need uh, in order to convince someone to install an application, and happy days for an attacker. And it's fairly effective, because we see this way more often than we would expect. So if we look at other threat actors out there, I mean, if we go back a year with Viper Ant, this was a targeted um, attack against members of the Israeli Defense Force, where pretty much the same thing, um, the same thing happens. Um, members of the IDF were, uh, were sent messages on social media platforms from, um, from people, from fake profiles uh, of attractive women that said, you know, I'm not comfortable with this platform, but if you install this app, we can, we can talk more. Um, and that was pretty effective. We also saw it with XRAT, if we go back to 2014, where there was a Chinese-based actor targeting uh, pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong. Uh, both on Android and iOS. And nation states aren't the only people doing this, so cyber criminals as well. Um, so, you know, threat actors behind banking trojans like Marcha, GM Bot, Banker Mars Dealer, they're all doing the same thing, and you can see, based on the clicks, 6,000 clicks, simple message. It's a pretty low investment from attackers. There's no, uh, there's no risk of their tooling, um, uh, or... I suppose the risk of their tooling getting burnt and the cost of that is a lot less than if there was you know, some sophisticated exploit involved. So with, for example, NSO Group, uh, with Pegasus, when their, their uh, exploit chain was burnt, they needed to pretty much uh, shift all their, um, uh, shift how they were delivering their tooling, uh, which would have been quite expensive. Whereas in the case of these tools, you know, it's, it's a low investment as most of this code is public. 
Now, during this investigation, we did actually identify a, an interesting sample on one of the command and control servers, and we were surprised to see that it was actually FinFisher. Um, so for those of you not familiar with FinFisher, it's um, a lawful intercept uh, tool um, for multiple platforms. Um, and uh, it's, I think, several years ago, it, their, they were compromised, and their, their list of customers, as well as um, the agencies in various countries who purchased their tooling was leaked uh, online. Um, so that included Trojan IDs, um, as well as agency names. And in this case, uh, when we're extracting the configuration content from FinFisher samples, we noticed that, um, first off, the sample wasn't in VirusTotal. Uh, the Trojan ID wasn't listed in these public leaks at all. Um, but then also, there were three mobile endpoints in the configuration of this sample that all had plus 78. Um, so plus 78 is the Kazakhstan calling code. Uh, and then the, the package compilation time lined up with EFF's previous research um, into OpManel. So we're pretty sure at this stage that um, this actor had either purchased or uh, was using a demo version of this tooling, um, either, either in, um, uh, during the, uh, the Kazakhstan uh, attacks. Um, yeah, but since then, it, it appears that they'd shifted to actually creating their own tooling and um, writing some in-house uh, surveillance ware. And um, yeah, Cooper will just take over the, the desktop side of things, so they weren't just writing for, yeah. um, for mobile. So in addition to the mobile component, there was a desktop component to, op, uh, to Dart Caracal as well. And in stark contrast to the mobile component, the desktop component was actually quite sophisticated. The desktop component used chain zero-day exploits and pivoting access off compromised SCADA systems using the blockchain for exfiltration. No, sorry, that's disinformation. Um, <laughs> it was phishing. And there were no exploits used. Because there are no exploits needed, phishing works every time because people still click on links, and people still run documents with macros. So what we found uh, on the servers was a number of infected documents, Word, Excels, PDFs, all with macros and JavaScript that would run and download a second stage. This is stuff that's been going on since the 90s, but it still works, because people still click on macros, people still open interesting-looking documents. We also found an infected CHM, which is Microsoft's sort of binary HTML help format, uh, which was tooled to run PowerShell. And that was pretty interesting. This is not something that I've seen before. The PowerShell, though, is pretty standard for any macro or JavaScript that you might see. It starts a hidden window, downloads a stage two from a server somewhere, and then runs it. The fact that you can do this in a help file is kind of amazing uh, on Microsoft's part. But there it is. So given that, what do we see for the stage two malware? What's being downloaded here? One of the samples, we found two different samples. One of them, uh, or we found two different families of malware and a bunch of samples. The first is Banduk. Banduk was also observed as part of Operation Mantle. And this is a new variant being used by Dirk, Dark Caracal. Banduk is the Hindi word for gun and also a series of excellent Bollywood action movies, of which this is a poster. It's also the Lebanese word for bastard. Uh, Banduk is modular. You can download several different components, and it's Windows only. It's available for sale online, and it's actually pretty cheap. But the copy that we found seems to be a private version. It's a lot more advanced. It's more well-packed than the version that's available online. And it's pretty heavily obfuscated. And to borrow Mike's words, we found it in enhanced copies of a drawing program and the circumvention software Siphon. And I used enhance in the sense to mean the same way that cyanide enhances tequila. So looking at Banduke, it was pretty interestingly packed. Um, all of the malware-related Windows API strings were encrypted in Base64 encoded inside the enhanced binary. The second stage binary is encrypted and stored as a binary resource in the original binary with a random eight-character name. The resource binary is decrypted at runtime in memory and injected into the iExplore process using a technique called process hollowing, 
which is you can think of it like the same way a phage infects bacteria. It starts the iExplore process, takes out all of the shell code, and inserts its own shell code, and then forks off and runs its own shell code, thereby subverting the already running process that is legitimately running in the system and running entirely in memory, which makes it more difficult to, pa to unpack. Uh, and that second stage is also packed with a custom variant of UPX, which is the really extremely common packer. So once we got all that unpacked and got all that out of memory, we found a pretty nice binary. Uh, and in that binary, we found several different command and control servers, at least 10. The and on those command and control servers, we found all of the data that had been uploaded from the infected computers. We also found web panels for other rats, including Iris Rat and Arcom Rat, which were available online. These are also commodity rats that are apparently being used for other campaigns in other places by these same or other actors on the same server. What is Banduke able to do? Well, most of the stuff that you'd expect and want from a espionage rat. It can start and stop the webcam. It can record your keystrokes. It can get a list of USB devices and a list of files, modify, upload, delete files from the computer. It can start a DDoS attack. And it can execute what we think are these second and third stages, execute TV and execute AMI. We didn't find any samples of those, but that might be interesting to check out as well. Uh, Banduke uses a plain text TCP protocol for communicating with the command and control server. It's base64 encoded, ending with three ampersands. And it's the same string delimiter and the same general communication theory that's used in the Palace mobile malware, which suggests at least inspiration, if not the same author, between these two malware families. And it decodes to something like this with a command and then an ID number, an IP address, the username, the version of Windows, et cetera, et cetera. We also found a second malware family called CrossRat. Oh, uh -oh. I didn't do it. Uh, <laughs> we found a second malware family called CrossRat. CrossRat is an entirely new f malware family. We've never found it anywhere on the internet before. And we know it's new because in the source code, we found that it was version 0 0.1, and it was released in March of 2017. It was very helpfully uh, commented in that way. CrossRat has pretty limited features, uh, but what's interesting about it is that it's written in Java, and it's cross-platform, given the name. It's able to target Windows, OS X, Linux, and we later found out even Solaris, in case your target is a 1990s era Sun system administrator. CrossRat has no obfuscation or packing. It's pretty new. It looks a little bit like maybe they got the intern to write his first malware for this. But given that, it's not too bad. It installs itself for persistence. It doesn't need to use any exploits because Java. And it communicates with the C2 over plain text, again, with a very similar protocol to the ones we saw in Banduke and Palace, meaning, again, we think that it's probably not the same author, but it's probably the author's intern. Um, and it uses, so here is the C2 communication. You can see the command and control server flexberry.com and the port 2223 encoded right here in one of the main classes. Um, and you can see the version number down there, 0 0.1. And then here you can see the uh, commands that come from the command and control server and the commands that it's able to uh, execute, which mostly are enumerating the file system, copying, moving, writing, and deleting files. Uh, and et cetera. So you're probably wondering at this point, well, tell us the interesting stuff. Who are these guys? Why are they doing this? What are they getting out of it? And where are they located? And me and Mike could tell you all of that, but we're not going to. Instead, I'm going to invite our colleagues, Eva Galprin and Andrew Blaich up here on the stage to tell you more about this in part two. So everybody give it up for Eva Galprin and Andrew Blaich. Right.